Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we have the amazing opportunity to interview Laurel Sherman. Laurel is an accomplished field naturalist who has studied flora, fauna, and funga of diverse ecosystems across the U.S. Originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, she received her B.S. in forest and wildlife biology from my own alma mater, the University of Vermont. In 2019, she received her master's in forest ecology at Oregon State University. And while in college, she led naturalist walks and taught other students about wild food and explored principles of ethnobotany. And then pursuing her thesis, she actually spent a stint in Montana working with the Owl Research Institute. And after college, returned home to Pittsburgh where she used her passion for nature to inspire others. There, she led urban greening projects and ran environmental education programs in K through 12 schools. Now, eventually moving to the Pacific Northwest, she has participated in many surveys of vegetative and animal biodiversity, and has even found time to start her own wild foods business. Laurel has set the intention early on in life to keep her education well-rounded and holistic. She was never pigeonholed into just one discipline and now has a great deal of experience in forestry, wildlife biology, botany, and environmental education. Mycology is a passion that has sprung up in the midst of her long-running communion with the environment. Helping humans foster connection with nature is her passion and she spreads that energy through environmental education with a focus on habitat plant associations and the use of wild foods laurel it's great to have you on the show it is such a pleasure to be here well i'm really excited because you are someone who has a diverse array of disciplines and areas of study when it comes to the natural world and the interrelationships in the natural world. I'm excited to hear your viewpoints on some of these fascinating relationships and how mushrooms and fungi feature in those. But before we dive into all this amazing information, I would like to hear a little bit about your story. I teased that we went to the same university and I had no idea, but what were some of the early influences in your life that got you interested in nature, in the sciences, and then how that progressed into the relationships and the work you do today? Yeah, so it's actually interesting that my entire family is, they're all lawyers. I'm the only one who <laughs> is not a lawyer. And so I often felt like a bit of an outsider running away into the woods. And my neighbors thought of me as a problem child because I ran away so much. But I honestly was just going to spend time in the neighborhood parks. And I speculate that my kindergarten teacher might have had something to do with my love of nature. Uh, her name was Mrs. Mungai, and she inspired me to paint my bedroom as a jungle. So I went to sleep with elephants and toucans and tropical plants on the walls. Uh, That's so I'm awesome. not sure if it had something to do with it, but. Um, yeah, I continued running away into the woods uh, as a teenager, escaping the city of Pittsburgh and heading southwest to Ohio, Ohio State Park and uh, the Appalachian Mountains. And then I really kind of took a deep dive into ecology while at the University of Vermont. I had some stellar professors there, Dr. Alan Strong and John Allen, who were really inspirational and key in giving me the support and confidence to continue down this path. You are definitely a creature of the forest, if you will. And that's just really interesting that you went to University of Vermont because they do have such a strong environmental program. Uh, we were talking before the show. That's actually what I went there originally for and gradually switched my way to business. That's interesting to hear that. And then tell us a little bit about research with the Owl Research Institute. Just a brief blip about that because that's intriguing too. Yeah, so I had to do a thesis for my wildlife biology program at UVM, and most people did their research on studies that had already been done, and they were doing analysis on data, but I love to bite off more than I can chew always, so <laughs> I wanted to do my entirely own study, and so I contacted a bunch of researchers, but really connected with Denver Holt at the Owl Research Institute, and took a semester 
at uh, University of Montana in Missoula instead of being at UVM. And I took that time to research great horned owl reproduction success in the Mission Mountains, which is just south of Glacier National Park. So this is the highest density of raptors in the country there. And we were looking at how different raptors kind of interacted with each other and how that influenced reproductive success. So I was looking at everything from golden eagles to red-tailed hawks and how those species interacted with the great horned owl. So I basically just looked at baby owls all spring. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds like a fantastic thesis. And I think that gets to a bit of your personality where you went out, kind of forged your own path, wanted to do your own research, Uh, even if it was to look at baby owls, it's still really kind of brave to to do that. And then when did a passion for fungi or mushrooms come into this? Was there any foraging when you were running away to the woods? Were you doing wild food foraging? And then how'd you get started at UVM sharing those skills with people? Yeah. So I, um, I remember as a, a teenager in high school, when I would run down to the Southwestern corner of Pennsylvania, um, my friends and I would be looking for morels and chicken of the woods and wild ramps. But that was kind of it. We were just focusing on those big, no toxic lookalike type species. That's kind of just the culture of southwestern Pennsylvania. And most people do that. But I really got involved in it at UVM because I met a PhD student who was in the field naturalist program. I think his name was Teague, but I went on some of his naturalist walks and just became completely obsessed and ended up helping him out and then starting to do my own thing. So that was uh, aside from my actual academic program there, which was forestry and wildlife biology. Uh, That was just a hobby thing that I did. But how I ended up at UVM was because I have always known that I wanted to work with wildlife. And so I chose my school, my pool of schools all had really great wildlife biology programs and UVM has an excellent one. So that's how I ended up there. And of course, that passion for wild food meshes well with the study of forest ecology and the study of wildlife. I mean, increasingly, as I learn more and more about fungal organisms and the relationship to other organisms, these things become inexorable. And so you end up kind of having to study everything to see why things happen the way they do in a forest. And that leads us to then your graduate work there in Oregon, where you were studying forest ecology. So I guess, what does that entail? I mean, what is the study of forest ecology? Yeah, so it actually kind of depends on what perspective you're coming from. So Mm. if you are a silviculturist, for example, you're interested in in forest ecology in in a lens of marketable timber and what you can do to increase the growth rates of trees. If you're more on the wildlife biology side of things, which is where I am, you're looking at how we can create sustained healthy habitat over time, Um, maybe not in the same location, but you know, basically shifting habitat throughout the state, for example. And so that's taking into account forest succession and tree pathogens and and understanding that the tree, the habitat type is always changing due to insects, disease, natural disturbance. And so you're taking that all into account to have a long-term plan for wildlife habitat. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. And now do mushrooms or fungi play a role in the lens through which you view the forest and the forest ecology? I mean, we know about mycorrhizal fungi that connect trees. Obviously, there's saprobic fungi that are decaying things in forests. But how do fungi and mushrooms get into the picture there with with your studies? Yeah. So when I was learning about this type of stuff in my undergrad at UVM, it was unfortunately not a major part of what we were learning in forest ecology because I think we didn't Mm. really understand it too well yet. But now it's a really crucial part in understanding how to work with habitat. So um, we're learning more and more that ectomycorrhizal fungi actually shape the way that the forest looks in multiple ways. For example, in Douglas fir forests, regenerating seedlings benefit from being a part of that mycorrhizal network. However, they have to be a certain spatial distance from mature trees. So if they're too close to a mature tree on the network, they'll die from competition. But there's Mm. this 
threshold of distance that allows them to thrive on the network without being overcompeted. So you're, you know, these fungal networks are literally shaping the spacing of our forests in that example uh, in Douglas fir. So I've recently been working a lot on ponderosa pine forests on the east side of the Cascades in Oregon and Washington. And the really crucialness of mycorrhizal fungi it has been fascinating me the past few weeks. So I've been reading about how historically the east side forests had low severity frequent fires that never got too hot and never damaged the soil or the microorganisms maybe below the first inch. So it wasn't an issue. Mm -hmm. But as we've been dealing with fire suppression for over 80 years, we have a buildup of fuel loads and overstocked or overly dense trees in our forests. And that leads to really high severity, these catastrophic wildfires that we're seeing that are much hotter than the ecosystem has evolved to sustain. The soil is actually really good at buffering fire temperatures, but once we get these really high intensity fires that we start to see uh, live tree root and fungal death in the top four inches of the soil, anywhere after, once the soil reaches 140 degrees, the fungal networks and the tree roots start to die. And so something that's really cool is that Soil buffers the temperature so well that the impacts of this, this heated soil only happen up to four inches under the soil based on studies in Ponderosa pine forest. And so that means any propagules of mycorrhizal fungi under that four inches survive and persist and are actually responsible for the regeneration of the forest post wildfire. Wow. So, yeah, it's really cool. So in these high severity fires, uh, we actually see a complete shift from basidiomycetes pre-fire to ascomycetes post-fire because um, there are certain species of ascomycetes that are called fire obligates, and they actually are able to persist with these high temperatures in the soil. Pyronema and Morchella are two that are important here, and they inoculate seedling roots, regenerating seedling roots of ponderosa pine and allow them to grow in these really stressful post-fire conditions. So we, we, we pretty much have ectomycorrhizal fungi to think for post-wildfire forest regeneration, at least in ponderosa pine forest, but I imagine probably everywhere. Yeah, so when you see morels after a forest fire, that's probably a great sign that the Morchella species have come in to reestablish some kind of mycorrhizal network to let forests return. Absolutely, yep. That's a, a fire obligate fungal species. You know, I've heard of fire obligate tree species, but right. now we, we are aware of fungal fire obligates as well. Now that's fascinating. And you're studying how to maintain forests and use forests as an effective habitat or the most effective possible habitat for wildlife in an event like this, or maybe another example, how does that fungal flora relationship then play into the lives of wildlife and, and animals in that area. Yeah, so if we stick with the ponderosa pine forest, just to make it a little bit easier, there are, so that's, a, it's a fire adapted ecosystem and it depends on fungi for recovery, but it also depends on fungi for habitat creation. So there's a species of woodpecker called the white-headed woodpecker. It's a species that's at risk in the Pacific Northwest because of suppressed fire. So it's a fire obligate bird actually. And that is because it requires the habitat created by these fires. The white-headed woodpecker, it requires these big old ponderosa trees with open, with a lack of understory, like open space that it can fly around in. And with fire suppression, we get this overstocked forest. They're no longer able to live there. So, Reintroducing prescribed fire into the ecosystem there is a source of habitat creation for things like white-headed woodpeckers. There's also arboreal rodents and lots of other cavity nesting bird species that depend on cavities in trees, which are actually created by decay fungi. Mm. So if you think about woodpeckers excavating their nests, uh, their nest cavities, they yeah. are not able to do that in hard, healthy, live wood. They're relying on decay fungus to decay the wood to some certain level that works for that species. 
So the fungi not only play a role in supporting tree life and tree health and forest health, but they're also physically creating habitat yeah. for wildlife. I mean, I thought, you know, my obvious example is, oh, they make the trees come back healthier, more trees means more sources of habitat. But, you know, the fungi directly creating habitat for wildlife, that's that's really interesting. And then obviously those birds, those smaller rodents, then kind of work their way up the food chain as well. So it becomes like this keystone element of, of bringing life and some kind of food web back into play. Yeah. So another fun example is rhizopogon, which is a hypogeus kind of, it's a false truffle that we have in the Pacific Northwest. And it is actually a really important food source for arboreal rodents like flying squirrels. And then also the flying squirrels are an important method of spore dispersal. So for rhizopogon in particular, spore dispersal is really important. And these rodents are doing that for them. And then on top of that, the you know, the rhizopogon are creating healthier forest ecosystems to support the habitat of those arboreal rodents. So it's this really great interconnected situation. <laughs> I just got this visual of the flying squirrels dropping spores as they're going across the forest. The flying squirrel spore dispersal squad. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of your work then is focused on the ponderosa pine. Like you said, I would imagine a lot of these relationships carry over to other temperate forests as well. Yeah, so I'm actually newly working on ponderosa pine forests. Mm -hmm. um, I just got a new job that requires me to work on them. But prior to that, my research was actually on the west side forests, the Douglas fir forests. And so there is a lot of transferability and a lot of crossover, definitely. I was working on bird species that were cavity nesters on the west side, and they too rely on decay fungus and disturbance to create their habitat as well. It's just, it just looks a little bit different because on the west side, fire is less frequent and often more severe. So on the east side, we have highly frequent fire that is not very severe, traditionally pre-European settlement. And then on the west side, we have not frequent fire, but when it does burn, it burns really hot and it's a whole kind of forest stand replacing fire. So it's still fire dependent ecosystem, but at a very different scale. You know, there, there's different fire regimes for different parts of the Pacific Northwest and honestly, all of our country. Fire just happens at different frequencies and severities. Do you see the prescribed burns as really one of the best tools people have to manage forest ecosystems? Or I guess, what are some of the applied tools that scientists, rangers, people who look at these issues, what are some of the tools they use to manage forest ecology or try to achieve homeostasis? Or is it the kind of thing where the less human interference, the better? Yeah, that's a that's a great question that potentially people might disagree with the answer that I'm going to give, which is fine. But I personally think that we have altered the state of our forests, certain forests. So I'll preface by saying that old growth forests that are in existence now are in homeostasis and they do not need our help. They can just continue doing as they do. We need to stay away and leave them alone. Yes, leave the old growth alone unless maybe a raging wildfire is coming towards it, then maybe <laughs> get involved. But, Good point. So I'm talking about all of the forest that has been previously managed. Most of our forests have been cut down before and we have second growth, like mid-successional forest. And right. it's really just not in a natural state. That mid-successional forest was always around in the Pacific Northwest, but at lower percentages of ground cover. And so, for example, the Ponderosa Pine Forest, the fuel loads are so high. There's so much young lodgepole sapling and coarse woody debris all over the ground that if we just go in there and do a prescribed fire, it will likely get out of hand because the fuel loads are so high now. Right. So we're actually having to go in and do thinning treatments, take out some of that young uh, lodgepole sapling and the really young ponderosa pines, leaving all the big old ponderosa pines because they're by nature fire resistant, and then going in and removing all that dead wood, masticating it and burning. So 
it's just it's gone too far, at least in that ecosystem, to just light things on fire. However, I do think that prescribed burning is 100% necessary. It just requires more thought now. If we don't do these types of management, active management treatments, I think catastrophic wildfire will become more and more common, especially with climate change driven drought and insect attack. So yeah, so yes, prescribed fire is a great tool in the box, but it's really tricky right now to keep the prescribed burn at bay and not have human lives or property come into contact with that. Right. And are the mid-successionist forests, are those forests, you know, that have been replanted, let's say a timber company clear cuts an area and then says, oh, we're going to replant everything. It'll be the same. Is that the kind of forest that you're looking at? And I guess, how does that differ from an old growth forest or a forest that's naturally developed over centuries? I know that's a huge question, but as kind of an overview, just so we know the differences between forests we're looking at, you know, not all forests are created equal, especially like you're saying, when there's a man-made forest, if you will. Yeah, totally. So if we look at the mid-successional forests um, on either side of the Cascades, if we're looking at Douglas fir planted forests, so yeah, they'll, they'll come in and they'll cut and they'll plant within, I think they're required by law to plant within two years mm. of the operation. So all these trees are going in at the exact same time and they're the same height, the same age seedling. So when they grow up, you have one age of tree. And so you just essentially get this minimally complex system with full canopy coverage, which minimizes the amount of understory growth that can happen. And, you know, at some point, if you step away and stop managing it, there will be natural disturbance that will cause some trees to fall and open up gaps. And that process will slowly start to bring it to a more complex multi-story forest structure. But in an old growth, natural Douglas fir forest, you already you have that that vertical and horizontal complexity. You've got big gaps in the canopy that allow light to hit the floor and create differences in microclimates. And yeah, it's just they look totally different and they function totally differently and they have different levels of biodiversity. So it, yeah, it's pretty obvious when you walk between the two. I had a feeling it would be. And going along with that, I mean, it sounds like outrageous diversity or much more complex systems is always going to lead to a stronger forest as a whole. Totally. Yeah. Higher resilience. I think increased species richness has been linked to resiliency in, in certain ecosystems. And that makes sense to me inherently. Yeah. Uh, now, another thing I'd be getting interested in is this I concept of agroforestry or you know, that permaculture concept of food forests and cultivating these natural thriving forests that are ecosystems unto themselves that have achieved homeostasis. They just happen to be growing a lot of food. Do you have any experience with that? And does your understanding of forest ecology give you any insights about agroforestry at all? So that's such an intriguing question. And I really have never thought about utilizing agroforestry in a forest ecosystem sense in the wild. I've definitely worked on implementing urban food forests and community gardens while I was in Pittsburgh. But yeah. it's actually, so I'm kind of at this crossroads where I have two career paths right now. One is going down the wild foods and foraging business route, and the other is going down the forest ecology route. And you're bringing up this this question of bringing food forests into the forest. And I'm thinking, wow, this might be a way to connect the two and integrate them and not have to choose. But I haven't ever seen anybody doing it. I think part of the reason why is because there's so much bureaucracy and red tape right, right. now surrounding how we manage forests on right. public and private land. So private land owners... They're doing what they're doing for marketable timber and they're doing the necessary regulations for wildlife habitat as well. But the mentality is quite different. And then on public lands in the Pacific Northwest, we're dealing with uh, endangered species and the Northwest Forests Practice Act in 1994 was enacted because of the North Northern Spotted Owl and that kind of stopped all cutting on public lands. So now we're dealing with wow, how do we deal with all these forests that haven't been cut in 
an, over a decade. So I think the agroforestry part is really intriguing. It just hasn't been looked at because everybody is so concerned with, you know, endangered wildlife species, erosion, stream habitat, and salmon spawning. And, right. and there's very limited dollars right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and it adds... You know, hyper complexity, it sounds like is good for forests. Maybe it just adds a little too much complexity. You know, I just had this utopian vision of if we're already playing a more active role in stewards and how we develop ecosystems using applied methods like prescribed burns, maybe like introducing beneficial mycorrhizal fungi, maybe somehow creating forests that are more vibrant, more able to act as effective habitats for diverse wildlife. I thought, man, what if we could also apply principles of agroforestry to make these big thriving food forests or maybe the big thriving forests that are habitat to wildlife would also use fruit trees and different things in the understory. Uh, and that could be like a source of publicly available food that no one would need to upkeep, no one would need to manage. It would just do its thing. But it sounds like, as was my instinct, that is a little utopian and mm -hmm. people have a little more defined goals or issues they're trying to solve in these different spheres. That brings us beautifully though into that other half of Laurel's potential career path. And that is urban greening projects and urban permaculture, agroforestry. Tell us a little bit about that work that you did in Pittsburgh. And then we can go to see kind of how that's developed and some more insights, insights you have into that world. Born and raised in Pittsburgh, and then I moved away for college, and I ended up back there after college for a really cool job with the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. Hmm. And they are a nonprofit that works on conservation and water quality, but also they have a big urban greening and green spaces department, which I became heavily involved with. And so we implemented some urban greening projects that included stormwater gardens and green walls and green roofs, but also we did a, well, they're still doing it now. It's a school grounds greening project, and it is a K through 12 urban city school centered program where we would come in and identify needs that the teachers and the staff had for their school grounds and the needs of their children in terms of environmental education. And we would come in and do these really cool projects like implementing big interactive gardens that had, we built a giant nest out of grapevines that the kids could sit in. And, you know, we would involve kids in doing different arts and crafts projects for the outdoor space. And then we would come back and implement a curriculum on environmental education, utilizing that space and providing the teachers there with the resources in case they wanted to or had the time and energy to continue down that path of environmental education. So really, at least in my experience, it was uh, wildly rewarding because some of, the, some of these kids had never held or knew what an earthworm was before, which to me was wild, but wow. it's, you know, it's just a, a situation of different backgrounds. And it was really incredibly rewarding to bring a little bit of what I love uh, about the outdoors to some of these students' brains and hoping maybe that would inspire them someday <laughs> to continue down that path. Well, that relationship with nature is so central, at least I believe, is so central to what it is to be human. Were the kids you taught, were the schools you taught with, were the kids receptive? Did they really love doing this kind of thing? Oh, 100%. Usually what happens is the first 30 minutes, everybody's a little bit freaked out because they're not from the <laughs> situation and they're shy and they don't, you know, they don't want to get their hands dirty. But then almost every time without fail within the first hour or two, you know, especially the ones who were the most timid at the beginning are the ones who end up the dirtiest. So yeah, it, it's a great place to, to bring children to be creative and get inspired to bring them into the outdoors, especially in a safe place right by their school to dig around, plant some plants, look at butterflies. Yeah, it was, it was really great. We all need that time to plant plants and look at butterflies. I think it balances us out. You can't put people under artificial lighting, especially kids locked in a room where you can't move under artificial lighting. Maybe not locked in a room, that's drastic, but in a classroom <laughs> under artificial lighting for eight hours a day, it feels like necessary. You need that outdoor education 
to just give people a breather, get some circulation of energy, if you will. So then you can go back and get back inside and do whatever other learning you have to do. But I guess how widespread in your experience are these kind of programs? Was Western Pennsylvania, did you think it was unique or are these kind of education programs going on all over? I did think that the Western PA Conservancy was unique at the time because they had so many different programs going on at once and we all worked in the same building. So we were all very connected and could share information. Mm -hmm. It was super cool. And I didn't know of too many other situations like that. My sense is that that might exist in big urban centers um, around the country. But I think now it's becoming more important. At least people are recognizing its importance. And I've heard of more urban farms and urban greening projects popping over all over the country. So I think it is starting to gain some momentum in the past five or 10 years. Yeah, I'm hearing more and more about projects to do this kind of environmental education, getting into school systems. And I'm also starting to hear a little bit about mycology curriculums or curriculums based around fungi somehow getting integrated into to K through 12 classrooms. During any of your work, did mushrooms or fungi come up at all? Did you ever make mushroom gardens with people? Did that feature? You know, there was one mushroom type cutout thing that went into one of our gardens. Unfortunately, it wasn't a huge piece of the program, right. but I think that it should be because literally, like we were talking about before, everything is so interconnected with fungus in some way. And so the th some of the things we were teaching the students, such as tree health or habitat, mm -hmm. that is inherently linked with fungal networks and connections and decaying fungus. So... If I ever go back, I'll, I'll make sure to implement a, a fungal program into the environmental education. <laughs> With these relationships, you know, being so complex, when you talk about tree health or forest ecology, have you found any strategies that are effective at sharing this? with kids or especially teenagers? Have you found some strategies, some science communication strategies that are effective at inspiring people to, to pay more attention or be more conscious of these relationships, things like forest health? Yeah, I think definitely teaching by showing and getting people into the outdoors is the ultimate best way. When you're mm -hmm. talking about K through 12 kids, you know, they're, if a substitute or some guest speaker comes into the classroom, they're like, yay, this is a free period, you know, you don't <laughs> have to do anything. But if you take them outside, they still might think that, but at least you're getting them to feel some sort of, at least starting to feel some sort of inspired connection or emotion with something that we're talking about. Um, and that rings true with Teenagers, college students, adults, pretty much everybody. I, uh, I taught forest biology and fire ecology at Oregon State University as well. Yeah. So that's undergraduate students. And the same thing applies. They learn way more when we're out in the field, uh, in the outdoors teaching labs than if we're in a classroom. And I think that makes a lot of sense because that's how I function too. If I'm trying to memorize fungus from a book or birds from a book, it doesn't really stick until you get out there and you see it and it's repeated and you feel it and you have some sort of emotional attachment to it. Definitely being in the outdoors is the best, but if you can't be in the outdoors, I think bringing some sort of personal connection and relatability to the situation. Like how are you related to this topic? How do you interact with this topic in your daily lives? Yeah, and to make it personal to Laurel here, what was your calling to educate kids and educate people about the environment, about what you study in forest ecology? What does that give to them? What are you hoping to impart to your students? And then what does that do for you in terms of completing your own mission or you know, helping to, to shape the world? I was an environmentalist at a young age. <laughs> given that I went to the University of Vermont. But right. I think that um, I really felt like the strategy to get people to care about our environment and to feel invested to make a change is to have them build connections with nature. And that's where this all started. But since then, it's kind of become bigger and more important than that. Um, I think that the connection that we build with nat our natural world goes beyond just becoming an environmentalist or caring about, you know, the future of our world. It's more about finding yourself, figuring out 
coping mechanisms during hard times, understanding each other more. I think that broadly, when we build connections and understand the complexities of nature, that allows us to build more strong interpersonal connections with ourselves and with other people. So that's kind of been my overarching mindset. Figuring out a way to do that while inspiring um, people to continue down the path in science as a career um, has been really fun for me. <laughs> so it's like you're teaching people so they get all the great benefit that you've gotten from understanding science and complexity. And that's what I'm always struck by is how that organic process of just setting people off in that exploration lets them really change themselves. But with some of this knowledge, what are some of these big, you know, environmental issues that we're facing and how does an understanding of forest ecology help? How does urban greening help? You know, what are some of the tangible ways which just a couple of these, because obviously your experience is super broad spectrum, but just a couple of these things we talked about, how does that help with some of the problems that we're facing? So going in two different directions here, I'll start with the, I think, Right now, there's a big lack in trust in the scientific process, and there's also widespread poor science communication. So the two of those go hand in hand, uh, and there's really not a surprise that there's a lack of trust in science right now. So I think that starting from the ground, from grassroots efforts, personally connecting with people and not saying, hey, let's let's take a formal class together and learn about this, or let me tell you about what I know, but kind of getting their hands dirty and showing them the process and peppering in scientific information and saying like, yeah, you can kind of see how this all fits together, right? It's really intriguing and fascinating. Uh, yeah. I think for me, that's been an effective way to start to have people gain trust in science. So you see that as one of the core issues really is the lack of effective science communication. I mean, science communication is something we're hearing a lot about now. That's one of my goals with Mushroom Hours to showcase amazing people working with fungi and, you know, amazing scientists and spread their work to people. But you think there's kind of an onus on the educators and the scientists to find a way to be more approachable, maybe? I don't think it totally falls on science. Well, you know, it does fall on scientists and educators right, to right figure out how to disseminate their information in a way that is available and accessible and understandable to people. It also falls on the system where currently when researchers submit a paper to be in a peer-reviewed journal, that is only accessible to those within institutions or otherwise you're having to spend $50 on a research paper, which is completely inaccess inaccessible. And that's starting to change now. Open source journals used to be like, oh, that's, you know, that's not credible, but that's not how it is anymore. There are some great open source journals. So it's slowly shifting, but it's still a problem. Uh, even in my research, now that I'm not at a university anymore, if I want to read a paper that is an open source, you know, I'm not going to pay 40 bucks out of pocket. So I'm not going <laughs> to somebody who's trying to learn about a topic for fun. The system is set up that way. And also science communication, like you said, is becoming more pressing and more people are taking workshops and figuring out the skills. But yeah, I think it's crucial in fostering a trust in science into the future. And from what I see, I think a big part of that is this rising tide of citizen scientists. And I think more people that are of our generation, and because I know when you graduated from UVM, I know we're contemporaries, I think more people of our generation are becoming the scientists, the graduate students, the ones that have access to that paywalled information. And like you, I think a lot more people are getting that inclination to be open source, to try to communicate it with the biggest population that's possible. So somehow I think that gap is being bridged between citizen science and what I want to say, sympathetic scientists that want to get this information out. Yeah, maybe saying the onus is on the educator is like assigning blame. Like, no, we just need to let this natural process of creating a new system of science communication to kind of fully flesh itself out. And then maybe yeah. we'll have people more engaged with real scientific information and maybe eliminating some of that confusion that comes from not trusting science or just not having it and understanding it. 
Absolutely. And I think with the accessibility, increasing accessibility of resources on the internet nowadays, you see a lot more self-taught scientists like Rachel Zoller, for example, with mycology, you know, she's self-taught and that's incredible. That's all self-education. And I've heard stories of people were trying to work on a cure or a vaccine for coronavirus and they're completely self-taught. And it's amazing what you can do nowadays as a citizen scientist without having a PhD or a master's. So I think you're right. I think the, the gap is being filled. And I'm just thinking you don't necessarily have to get rid of the rigor of a scientific journal, but somehow making that more accessible seems to be the best way forward to get everyone on board and empower a citizen science community because science, the scientific process, practicing science is really the, the domain of all humans. We can all engage in this seeing some kind of getting very utopian, but yeah, I think seeing some kind of open source science is, is really the, the best way forward. I think the, the bio blitzes that happen all over the country are a great example of that in rural and urban centers. There are bio blitzes that happen where there's people who are hobbyist mycologists or birders or whatever go out and spend a day identifying as many species as they can. And now we have this fantastic wealth of knowledge about species diversity and all these places that we would have never had if it were just up to formal academic scientists. Now, as advice for all of us amateur foragers out there who want to feel like we're citizen scientists and contributing, what are some of your recommendations for contributing to this vast uh, tree of biodiversity knowledge, crowdsourced biodiversity knowledge? What are some of your tips? Yeah, I think if you live in an area where there are community based groups, mycology or birding groups, that's a great place to start. There's institutions. Um, you might try to get in touch with researchers there and see if you can volunteer. Or um, I know that some local birding groups, for example, put on their own kind of bird census situations every year. And so it's completely citizen science based and the information is logged through the Audubon Society. So I think mm. Getting involved with your communities at the community level is probably the best way to figure out that information, but really just starting by getting out there and learning it yourself, being outside, collecting data on your own, writing down observations, maybe hey, this mushroom fruited at this time this year, which is three weeks earlier than last year, and thinking about why that might be. And you can also do citizen science in that way as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be through some organized group. Yeah, I've had a lot of success in the group context, but then I've also had a lot of success and accelerated my learning doing it myself once I got kind of the kickstart from people who, who knew what they were doing. Uh, so yeah, I definitely see the, the merits of both methods there. And so we've been talking about this education side, your science communication mission. And like you said, those were kind of the one of the two career paths that, that you had laying out in front of you. Now, what is the other side in terms of the wild food? I know you said you're just getting this wild food business started. So tell us where you are in terms of foraging, how much of a passion that is in your life and about the wild food company that you're starting. Sure, I have spent a lot of my life foraging, but it's been for personal enjoyment and hobby purposes. Recently, I've started turning that into a more formal career. So I spend, I don't know, maybe three days per week foraging at least. And that could be in my urban area or taking drives out into the woods. But it's a really important part of my life. And when I don't do it, I feel the stress building. So <laughs> yeah, I've started to teach wild foods and foraging courses through Wild Craft Studio School, which is located in Portland. Rachel Zoller also teaches there. Yeah, so Chelsea was gracious enough to bring me on to their, their group of teachers. However, I'm also looking to, so I'm starting my own wild foods business, which is by the time this airs, it will be fully launched. But I will be picking out private groups, one-on-one -on -one groups, and kind of tailoring my classes to what people want to know. So this could be as informal as, hey, what types of wild herbs do you have within a one mile radius of your house? Or let's go spend six hours out in the woods uh, learning how to identify trees and mushrooms and their association. So I, I really love teaching at Wildcraft. I just want to have the, the flexibility to 
inspire people in a diversity of ways. So yeah, I'm going to have that all set up to go by the time this airs. So if anybody wants to go for a walk in the woods. That's awesome. And do you think that the knowledge of foraging, the basic understanding of what I like to think of as sustainable, readily available local food sources, do you think this, this basics of foraging is a level of knowledge that really everyone should have? I guess I'm hesitant to say should based on people's time availability. I, yeah, I, I think it would be really fantastic for everybody to feel empowered to be able to feed themselves or supplement their food sources from the outdoors 100%. And I, at some point, will try to morph more into free community development type courses where I can take community members out and try to spread that knowledge to those who might not have the privilege of having that available to them. But right. yeah, I think right. it feels really good to know, especially in today's world, that the earth can still provide for us, even if we feel like it is a dire situation out there. You can still go out and find really insane amounts of food and medicine and sustenance. And I think that once people realize that, it's kind of like a breath of fresh air <laughs> and it's quite empowering. Absolutely. I think it's something that is really part of our, our deep ancestry. You know, human beings have always foraged and this idea that we're somehow disconnected from that even myself, I don't know a lot of the wild plants that I have in my backyard that I know are edible, yet I could tell like a million different corporate logos apart. It just feels like there's something backwards about that. And we need to like reclaim our heritage of, of wild food foraging. But I recently had a guest on that got me thinking about it in a different way. Just this idea that ecosystems, urban ecosystems, even some of the vast woodlands we have can't fully support everyone just going out and foraging if they're not mindful of sustainability and other considerations like that. So do you see a kind of balance there? And when you educate, do you try to give people an appreciation of some kind of sustainable practices? Absolutely. So as a forest ecologist, my brain works sure. in a very objective scientific way often. So I usually try to find a balance between that and the inspirational emotional side of teaching. But I think it's crucial as somebody who's teaching foraging to anybody to make sustainability a top priority. So that can include teaching somebody about a plant and then saying, but you really ethically can't harvest this. Mm -hmm. So it's good to know that in a survival situation, sure, this is here for us, but it's in such low numbers now and, and such a sensitive habitat that we really shouldn't be touching this if we're if we have food available to us. Um, but on the other side, I like to put a really heavy emphasis on utilizing invasive species or native species that are invasive in their growth pattern. So for example, Japanese knotweed, garlic mustard, these types of plants, it's like, let's just harvest as much as we can. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of tasty recipes and let me let me focus on that. Especially at Wildcraft in Portland, they're very interested in that sustainability piece, um, right. which I really appreciate. And so teaching people about native plant identification is obviously important, but so is learning about the differences in growth habits habits of plants, including invasive species or just native species that grow so quickly, like horsetail. You know, you don't have to worry about picking too much horsetail because it just grows prolifically versus something else like a, a fern root might, you know, you might want to only try that once in your life and not harvest again. I've been coming more conscious of it because I always tell people, go out, get wild food, pick as many mushrooms as you want. You're not hurting the mycelium. Go look at all these amazing wild plants with someone who knows your local area. But it's this other half of the coin of sustainability that I probably didn't fully appreciate and that people like yourself, people who have really done the work to be educators when it comes to wild food and wild foraging, really all seem to have an awareness of and a cognizance of, of also imparting the knowledge of sustainability. And that comes with 
the knowledge of the plant or mushroom is the knowledge of how rare it is or how resilient it is as a population and, and things like that. So I'm going to try to temper a little bit of my rabid enthusiasm for wild food with some knowledge of sustainability. And, and I'm not surprised to hear that, that you're very cognizant of that as well. And I guess for you personally, what does foraging, obviously we know that you can't go more than a couple of days without getting outside and going foraging, but what, what does it give to you? I mean, what does foraging mean in your life and beyond just the food? What does that relationship with nature and wild food uh, give to you? Yeah, um, I think that the most learning I've ever done about specific species or the way that they interact or the whole ecosystem is from being outside and being a part of it. And so by bird watching, picking mushrooms or searching for other wild foods, you're inserting yourself as a part of the ecosystem and you're you're forcing yourself to become really observant about where things grow at what time of year. Like, oh, I, I would have expected this to grow in this spot, but maybe oh, maybe the soil looks different. So let's think about what's in the soil. So you're really getting this extremely well-rounded view of how that ecosystem is all interlinked just by, you know, repeatedly looking for the same plant. Oh, it doesn't grow here and it grows here. Okay, I'm starting to understand the elevational and aspect influences here. So I think it kind of fits in with that that whole forest ecology mindset of everything is just interconnected as cliche as that sounds. <laughs> no, but the overlap is so apparent. I'm thinking you don't have to choose between these two career paths. You can definitely do them both. Yeah. Pursue forest ecology and the study of forest ecology, and then you'll already be outside all the time ready to pick wild food, right? Yeah, I hope so. I sure hope so. <laughs> That's great. Now, is there a name for the wild foods business? We're recording this in July. You're like, it's not totally launched yet. By the time this is out, it's going to be all out there. Do you have a name yet? Or is there anywhere people should look out for this? Any website domain already secured or anything? Yeah. So um, I am sticking for now with my Instagram name, which is Lorel Morel. And my website is lorelmorel.com. And that will be launched by the time this is out. So feel free to visit that. My partner and I are actually discussing he's also into wild foods and mushroom hunting and so you know our high in the sky dream is to join forces and create a wild foods business that also sells wild foods products but that is something that's way down the line so that's kind of like a goal that we're shooting for but for now i am operating under my instagram name laurel morell and i highly recommend people follow you obviously you've got a boatload of information about science. You make it very digestible and approachable, but you also have awesome photographs. I love the photography up on your page. Is that all with a cell phone or you got to have a fancy digital camera or something? It's a combination of both. I use my iPhone a lot, but I also have a pretty nice lens for bird watching. So if you see any pictures of birds that are really close, it's yeah, it's definitely a nice camera. <laughs> Okay, that's what I'm that's what I'm seeing. And because it's done this for me, has your very intimate relationship with nature where you've deeply studied ecology, studied wildlife, trees, fungi, go hunting for wild food, is that a form of spirituality for you? Is that kind of part of your your spiritual practice? 100%. Yes, going out multiple times per week is a ritual for my mental health, for my <laughs> coping mechanisms. It offers being in the outdoors and feeling connected with the outdoors through wild foods and mushrooms um, and birds and pretty much everything is a method for me to process information, learn about myself, learn about others. And yeah, it, it truly is a necessary part of my life. Inevitably, folks who have a really deep relationship with nature have this core spiritual connection with it. And ultimately, I think so many religions and different structures like that were just based on the awe and reverence that we feel when we're out in a grand, you know, undisturbed natural space. So I had a feeling and I think you said it really well. Yeah, I, I also think that it's quite popular to hike 
really far distances in a day or peak bag, which is fantastic. It's a great challenge on your, your body, your physical mm-hmm. body and mental. But I also challenge people to sit still in the same space for a longer period of time or to spend days in the same space and really getting to know the different skills of what's going on there. I think that can be an extremely spiritual experience as well. Um, You know, obviously peak bagging can be too, but I like to suggest that maybe, maybe try just spending a few days in the same spot or a few hours sitting and seeing what comes up. That's been super helpful for me. I, I just thought of different people's foraging styles where there are those people that kind of rip through the forest and the people that kind of study just one area for like two hours and really go to the base of every tree and really so maybe they're getting a little more spiritual richness out of their foraging if they stay in one space like that. Seems like they might be. Is there any big topic we've forgotten to mention? I mean, we covered a load of information. Is there any other project you want to mention? Any other message you make you want to make sure you impart? Wow. Yeah, there's so much more to talk about. But yeah, I guess just sending the message that if it feels overwhelming to start, if you get a field guide of wild edible foods and you open it and you think, wow, this is too much, just go outside and just walk around and just maybe pick one plant and look at it, see how many petals are on it, look at its needles, make observations and just, you know, get a start there. It can feel overwhelming for me a lot as well, especially with mushrooms. Um, just get outside <laughs> and just give it a go and, and take a friend with you and talk about what you're seeing and it can just be a really great time. Absolutely. And this highlights something really important actually that I don't want to miss. Do you have any advice in terms of resources, like online resources, books, and this could apply both to wild food, but also to forest ecology? You know, we may not all be in a position like you to get it masters and really dive in but do you have any maybe it's even mentors or people that we should that we should key into yeah yeah the three i get asked a lot about books the three books that i like to use in the pacific northwest are so one is edible wild foods by john callis and that's actually a general really great intro on just common weedy species that we all know and he takes a deep dive into each one of those so that applies to anywhere on in the country (laughs) And then Edible Plants of the Pacific Northwest by Douglas Dewar is a great beginner book for people looking to get into wild foods in the Pacific Northwest. And in terms of more forest ecology guides, I use Pojar, which I everybody refers to it at that, and I don't even know what it's actually called. It must be Plants of the Pacific Northwest or something, but the author is Pojar. And that is a fantastic resource for learning every part of the ecosystem in the Pacific Northwest from ferns and aquatic plants to trees. And that's a really useful guide. I also love Hank Shaw, Alan Bergman, Mallory O'Donnell on Instagram. And if anybody's looking to get into the founder of the, I think he's called the founder of modern wild foods because clearly indigenous wow. people utilizing wild foods long before this guy, but uh, Yule Gibbons, uh, he wrote several books. The first book I read of his was Stalking the Wild Asparagus. And it's just, it's really just a whimsical, whimsical book that includes recipes and and stories. And I highly recommend uh, Yule Gibbons to anybody who's looking to get some inspiration to get into wild foods. Those are all fantastic resources. And I'm going to make sure I put links in the show notes all the books you mentioned, all the people you mentioned, so people can use this as a resource to go off and dig in and forage for more knowledge, as it were. We've talked a lot about the wild foods. What are any other future plans that you want to tell us about? You know, I just got this job as a forest ecologist. Yeah, tell us about that. Um, I'm working with the U.S. Forest Service on three long-term forest ecology projects and kind of doing some project and data management and writing reports on the initial findings. And so in that process, I just started three weeks ago, but um, I'm already learning a whole different side of forest ecology. So that is my plan for the next couple of years. However, like I said, I'm teaching at Wildcraft Studio School, and we are going to kind of increase the forest ecology element of teaching there. So I will actually be teaching more forest ecology on a 
on a more accessible uh, level. And so we're going to be talking about things like fire ecology and plant associations. So yeah, I'm actually, you're right, I am actually starting to integrate the two, aren't I? <laughs> you're already doing it. And it's just so natural. I know so many people, including myself, who get so much more into science and biodiversity, biogeography and evolutionary history, all these amazing things about natural systems that you start wanting to learn about. And a lot of people start that journey through wild foods because food is something we all relate to. So I think that having someone like yourself who has all these skills and all this knowledge is like so crucial. So if anyone gets to go on wild food walks with you. I think they're getting kind of the double whammy of all the science they want to know and everything about uh, wild foods. Yeah, it just flavors. if the class name is, you know, wild foods of the coast, you're definitely going to learn about birds and trees too. <laughs> <That's another one. laughs> and I think that's really one of the amazing things about the wild food community is it is, again, it's blending the difference between professional science and citizen science by bringing everyone into the fold through something like food. And then suddenly they want to learn about all these amazing that are responsible for, for the wild food that they love. Mm -hmm. And I usually ask people a question about favorite mushrooms and we'll get to that, a mushroom that you want to highlight for us. I do want to know though, you know, a couple of your favorite culinary mushrooms and any recommendations you have in terms of like basic recipes or anything like that, to leave us with a little food inspiration, maybe make us a little hungry. Oh, wow. Okay. So I know that the Green King and Morel season has just ended, but my partner and I had some really fun food experiments with those two this year, including oil cured, perchini, pickled, fermented, mm. and making sushi with morels on it, and then using pickled cherry blossoms with the morel sushi. That's next level. Wow. Yeah, yeah, we we have some fun experimenting with mushrooms for sure. But I think as a lot of mushroom hunters say, whatever we're picking at the time tends to be what I'm really into. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So I have a hard time picking people ask like what's your top 5 and I just have a really hard time with that. Yeah, that's that's a tough one and that's why the question that I ask a lot of my guests has had to change. It couldn't be like, what's your favorite mushroom? Like you're asking me to pick my favorite child from you know, hundred, hundreds of thousands. Like I can't do that. Uh, but what is, what is a mushroom maybe that stands out to you? Maybe it's just the mushroom you thought of when I started talking about this and uh, what's something cool about it or why should we know about it? And if you want to throw us a curveball of one that we might not know about or one that's critical maybe to forest ecology, you've already talked about morel and rhizopogon, but are there any that, that stand out you want to share with us? Oh man, I mean, I've been coming to love Rise of Pogon pretty, pretty well. I just I want to add one more plug for Rise of Pogon. They actually, yes, please. Also, they've also been shown to antagonize root pathogens in tree roots. So wow. not only are they increasing nutrient and water availability, but they're also fighting off root pathogens of the pine trees out there or conifer trees. I mean, that that's pretty wild. That's and, huge. Yeah, and in response. Ponderosa pines give from 10 to 50% of their photosynthesis to the mushroom, which is a huge amount. So the rise of Pogon is clearly a fantastic uh, mutual relationship. And such a humble fungi. I mean, it doesn't have a big showy mushroom. Absolutely. But I do really love the shaggy mane, the, the shaggy ink cap so much. So I have it on my arm. Oh, I see that. A tattoo. Fantastic. Um, but I just really love the shaggy mane because it is so fleeting and it just deliquesces within hours. And I think that's so fun to teach uh, about the ephemeralism and fleeting nature of life and kind of show us life and death all within a day. And it's clearly a really fun mushroom to cook with as like a black squid ink substitute. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, I, I love that mushroom. You know, another question I just thought of that I don't know how I didn't ask you earlier. What is the role, just because you're so knowledgeable about wildlife, and this is something I brought up with a couple guests, you know, before and after podcasts. What is the role of big basidiomycete fruiting bodies in terms of the wildlife food web, how important is just that fungal food material for wildlife in the forest? I just can't believe I forgot that question. 
Oh yeah, I know that it is an important food source for different species of bears and ungulates like deer and elk. And I know that if there are any mushroom hunters listening, they're aware of that because when, especially when you're hunting for something as delicious like a spring porcini, you often come across big chomps out of them from an elk or a deer. Right. right. Um, yeah, but as we brought up, the they're extremely important food source for a lot of rodents like squirrels, brown squirrels and whatnot. But I do know that black bears in Oregon utilize fungus pretty frequently. Yeah, I would imagine that they're a highly important food source based on their protein and nutrient content. But I'm now realizing I need to look and see what the actual research says about that. I just have anecdotal evidence. Intuitively, all that sounds correct. And I love to think of bears chomping away on porcini out in the woods. But it's something when, you you know, you cut a mushroom open, you always see all the insects in it. So you got me thinking like, man, this is key for these insects and then work their way up the food web. So thank you for highlighting that. And now getting back to kind of huge questions that are hard to answer in a constrained time limit. What has a relationship with fungal organisms? What is the relationship with mushrooms given to you or brought to your life? Maybe insights, spiritual connection, anything like that? Definitely fungus has made me realize how complex everything is and how many nuances there are and how nothing is black and white and nothing is as easy as it seems. And that as scientifically advanced as humans are, we still really don't know anything. <laughs> There's, is, you know, the more we learn, the less we know type of deal. That's transferable to my own life because it's easy to make assumptions about why something is the way that it is or why somebody thinks something that they think. But if you bring in that mantra of, wow, like complexity is everywhere, you know, you, it makes you kind of reframe how you're thinking about issues like, oh, where did this person come from? Why did they get that opinion? Or why is this happening in this specific place? So it's kind of opened my mind to be more inquisitive about why things are the way that they are and what certain unknowns might be in a situation. I think it always has that strange effect where like studying mushrooms and fungal organisms and their connections somehow makes us better humans. Seeing through the eyes of fungi makes you a better person. Maybe that's no coincidence because we share an evolutionary lineage with fungi. But yeah, that's that's really interesting. Well, thank you for for sharing that. And then between your two paths there of exploring wild food, which are really, I think, one path you're bringing together beautifully, but exploring wild food, exploring forest ecology, educating people about these topics. What is the impact you hope to have with all of that work? You know, what is ultimately how you want that to affect the world, maybe add momentum to a movement that's already out there, or, or maybe, you know, play a part in changing people's lives? So I think that I've kind of touched on this throughout, but the the building of connections between individuals and the outdoors, as well as between individuals is really important. Mm -hmm. I think that building meaningful connections right now is more important than ever. And I think being outside and food is something that is extremely important to humanity. And we can all gather around food and especially wild food. Let's go out into the woods and have some sort of challenge or conversation and build a meaningful connection and share a meal over it. So that's important to me. And and that kind of trickles down to investment in stewarding the land around us. So if we start to build these connections with our neighbors and our community, as well as the natural spaces around us, we all feel jointly invested in taking care of and stewarding our natural spaces. And that could be something like a city park, or it could be an entire national forest, or it could be, you know, the entire marine ecosystem. It can be whatever it means for you. But without having that interpersonal connection with community and bringing that into the outdoors, I I think it's almost impossible to effectively steward the land. Yeah, I mean, with the state of the U.S. right now in terms of kind of different polarized spectrums of politics and obviously with all the environmental issues we're facing, it's like the themes you're bringing up that are able to enhance communities and enhance individuals' lives through this connection with nature, it seems like more relevant and more important than ever. And for me, it's like this constant source of hope 
that when we put out this message, when people like you share your information, it's like doing a little bit just to kind of further that goal and shift kind of the collective mindset of people a little bit more to a place where we can all coexist, hopefully. Yeah, and if there's one thing I've learned from environmental education, you could disagree on every political issue possible, but then you put a plate of of really well-cooked morel mushrooms in front of each other. (laughs) We're going to share a positive experience together, and that's somewhere to start, uh, you know, understanding each other's through that, that wild food. So I think that it's a really great place to start. As one of my favorite spiritual teachers, Matt Kahn, says, you have a heated argument. You say, okay, I'm hungry. Do you want to eat? Does that mean you agree with me? Not at all, but let's eat something. I think that that gets to the heart of that. Well, Laurel, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your information. I know on some of these, we just scratched the surface. I wanted to kind of cover some of the big themes in your work, but it'll be a joy maybe to have you on in the future and dig into some of these more deeply. But just thank you for being part of the Mushroom Hour and sharing yourself with us. It was a pleasure. Oh, it's been my pleasure. I'm such a fan. Thank you for having me.